Um, this is truly an historic time. We have President Trump, uh, a rather unique uh, presidential uh, figure who's been forced to endure an unrelenting daily assault from the news media and from his political rivals, the Democrats. Um, then we have House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who is also under siege, but remarkably it's from her own caucus. A significant part of the Democrat caucus thinks she's too conservative to be Speaker of the House. And that's, to me, that's a little bit remarkable, but that's the way that's shaping up. And then you've got the Republican Senate, which really is uh, relatively unchanged. They're pretty constant, and they still have not risen to the major challenges that we face as a nation on deficit and debt, on border security, on government-run health care. You may remember that thumbs-down thing when we were so close, and the larger struggle between socialism and free enterprise. Now, in Congress, things are also a little bit different. To give you an example of the size of the change, the Republican staff on the House Armed Services Committee this time last year was 47. Now it's 14. 47, 14, and worse yet, they're exiled. They don't even work on Capitol Hill anymore. They're now in the Ford Office Building, which is a little bit further away from the Capitol and the House Office Complex. So that gives you an idea of some of the things that happens when you uh, change from a majority to a minority status. Now I've got some public policy issues I want to touch on. If we could get to the uh, next slide, please. This one should be Representative Ilhan Omar. Uh, these are just some of the changes from a year ago uh, to today. Uh, Fifteen months ago, we were pushing a tax cut in order to stimulate the economy, and that worked. We've had the highest real GDP growth in 2018 that we've had in a decade. Now you've got a shift in philosophy of government. As you can see from uh, Representative Omar, she's thinking in terms as, of as high as a 90% income tax rate. Now let's be clear about a 90% tax rate. That means that at that marginal rate, that income over whatever the cap may be, and over time the, the cap tends to lower, uh, but that means that people who are in that bracket are actually paying more in taxes than they are earning above that certain amount. Because in many parts of the country, you still have county, city, and state taxes that are on top of that 90% tax rate, and you add them all up together, and you're actually paying the government money to work. And so you can imagine long term how that's going to depress economic activity and deter the incentive for those of us who are the most successful to go the extra mile and to work. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, this is something unique that is now being pushed. She's running for President of the United States. You have to give her words weight. Uh, she wants a wealth tax. That means that you add up all of your assets, subtract all of your liabilities, that's your wealth, and you pay a tax on that and you give it to the federal government. So that is a huge change if you think about just the complexity. It's one thing to try to figure out your income, but imagine how having to value everything you own and the kind of disputes that can be involved with the government as to how much this time may be worth or my car may be worth or whatever the wealth is that you're measuring. Um, very complicated, very complex, more federal government intrusion, but nonetheless, she's running for President of the United States and she thinks this is a winner. And we'll see how that uh, plays out. Now, there are a couple reasons for this huge interest in increasing taxes on the American people by the other side of the aisle. One, of course, is to pay for some new programs. They want more welfare, Medicare for all, I'll get into that cost in more detail. And they've got environmental programs like the Green New Deal. Uh, let's go to the next slide, though, and just to give you a little side effect of uh, Medicare for All or socialized medicine. In this case, Kamala Harris, who's third right now in the polling for the presidential nomination of the Democratic Party, uh, she is supporting Medicare for All, but interestingly, a subcomponent of Medicare for All is you no longer have private insurance. So whatever it is that your company has provided to you, particularly if it's good quality health insurance, that's gone under her uh, Medicare for all definition, under uh, Medicare for all definitions of most folks on the Democrat side. So ultimately, you're looking at 
uh, a higher government cost, of course, higher taxes to pay for it, and probably a lower quality of care, particularly if you're talking about life-saving measures that tend to be most expensive. If you wonder what I'm talking about there, look at the socialized medicine systems and see how they have to go through a triage system to determine who they're going to tell, go die, we're not going to take care of you, because the government makes those decisions versus the kind of system that we have here in the United States today. Now, let's go to the uh, next slide if we could. And we're going to start talking about um, the government shutdown that we just went through. One of the issues is why in the world did President Trump do this? Why the longest shutdown, uh, perhaps the longest shutdown in the history of the United States of America, what is at stake that would require these kind of extraordinary measures? And I want to talk about just some of the facts for a moment. And you can have debate over the pros and cons and opinions, but we need to really agree on a few of the facts. So with that as an aside, uh, with this particular slide, you've got data that comes from the Census Bureau that says about 11 million illegal aliens in America in the 2010 census. And then you've got a Yale University study that says, no, it's closer to 22 million as of now. That if those two numbers are accurate, that means the size of the problem, the magnitude, has doubled. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now you've got the cost that is involved. Now keep in mind that this study is based on the assumption that the Census Bureau numbers of 11 million illegal aliens in America from 2010 is still the number today. Now we know there's been an increase, so we know it's wrong, but with these financial numbers, this is assuming that the 11 million is still applicable. You have a net tax loss to American citizens, American taxpayers, at the city, county, state, and federal level of $116 billion a year. We're talking about totally building a wall, one-time expenditure for about 25 or 30 billion, versus this $116 billion a year in net tax losses. If the Yale study is accurate, then it's closer to $200 billion a year in net tax losses. The revenues produced by illegal aliens at the city, county, state, and federal level, delta the consumption of services consumed by illegal aliens in their households. Let's go to the next slide then. You've also got federal government data on crime in America. This data is over a two-year period. It's all federal government data, and quite frankly, if it airs, it airs on the low side, in my opinion. There have been 235,000 illegal aliens arrested for crimes by federal law enforcement officials and agents over the last two years. 100,000 of those were assaults, 30,000 of those were sexual assaults or sex crimes, and then there were 4,000 homicides or killings. That is an adverse effect of having illegal aliens in America. Keep in mind these are minimal numbers because these are people we have apprehended. Who knows how many others were committed where we were not able to apprehend them. Then you've got another problem associated with illegal aliens, and that's their voting in our elections. Diluting the vote of men and women of America who are lawful citizens. We don't know how much it is. We do know that in Texas, in the last couple of months, their Secretary of State identified by name over 90,000 individuals who had re represented in the recent past that they were illegal aliens. Don't know if they're still illegal aliens today, but in the recent past they had represented that they were illegal aliens. 90,000 who were registered to vote. 60,000 voted in one or more of the last few elections. So you've got this kind of adverse effect on the citizenry of the United States of America because it dilutes the voting power of Americans. And you've got a step further than this kind of problem, and Texas is just a microcosm of the bigger picture. Democrats in a number of major metropolitan cities and lesser metropolitan areas are pushing for voter registration of both illegal aliens and lawful immigrants and, of course, American citizens. And so all of them in many places around the country now can legally register to vote. Now, they're only supposed to be voting in municipal elections, not the state and not the federal elections. But that brings up the issue is, how do you stop them when they've got a voter registration card? How do you stop them when you've got a person who is in charge of the voting process who might like the way these people are apt to vote and so nod, nod, wink, wink, look the other way and let them come in with the voter registration card that they have. 
the biggest city that has made it legal for all people to vote, illegal aliens, lawful immigrants, and American cities is San Francisco. That's a pretty big community. And that's where the other side of the aisle wants to take us nationally. Where we're no longer an American country, you're in effect an international country where anyone who's inside our boundaries now has the ability to vote and help control our government, which in turn means dilutes the voting power of American citizens. Now, let's go to uh, the next slide. I'd be remiss if I didn't add this. I'm not going to go into the details because Mayor Tommy Battle told me he didn't want to be slitting his wrist today uh, during my remarks. So I'm, I'm going to let you all envision what the adverse effects of this can be without me illuminating any. But you can see the national debt chart and how we just blew through the $22 trillion uh, debt uh, not very long ago. I should add that we've got another crisis that is starting to build up because you know what? We've already reached our debt limit. So everything now until such time as this fight is resolved is through the use of extraordinary measures where the federal government is taking money from one fund in order to make operational costs. Social Security, for example, Medicare, that would be one of the funds from which the money comes. You can see the long term where we're expected, uh, now we're on the deficit, uh, where you can see the increase in the size of the deficit. We did pretty good in fiscal year 2015 but we have gone absolutely the wrong direction since then, and you're looking at a $1.4 trillion deficit uh, sometime within a decade. Let's go to the, to the next slide. Okay, now I'm going to start talking about those costs that the Democrats want to uh, add on, and we will see how all this plays out. We've got welfare on the one hand, and we've got environment on the other. We talked about Medicare for All, which is basically socialized medicine. Uh, the estimate is, uh, according to George Mason University, $32.6 trillion in additional spending over a decade-long period of time. Now, let's go to the, to the last slide, if we could. This is the Green New Deal cost. How many of y'all have heard of the Green New Deal? Raise your hands. Okay, you've heard of it. Good. That's $51 trillion to $93 trillion. You know, when I start throwing out millions which tends to be what they talk about at the city and county and state level or billions at the, at the state level. Uh, we're talking trillions, okay, big numbers. People's eyes tend to glaze over because it's so hard to comprehend a number that is that huge. Well, if you put the Medicare for All top dollar with the Green New Deal top dollar, then you're looking at half of the GDP of the United States of America being spent on just these two programs over the next decade. That's how big these things are, how costly these things are, and how impossible they are to implement because we literally do not have the cash. Now, is Mike Ward here? Chip Cherry, anyone from the chamber? Okay, Chip, I know you don't like me campaigning, but I'm gonna campaign just for a moment, hopefully in an effort to add a little bit of levity on the heels of this Green New Deal stuff, okay? So I'm gonna make some campaign promises. I promise you, that if you will re-elect me to Congress, a decade from now, we will still have electricity. All right? Electricity. Everybody wants that? And I promise you that if you re-elect me in a decade, we're still going to have hamburgers and steaks because we're still going to have those gas-emitting cows. All right? Everybody's for that, right? Hamburgers and steaks. And I promise you that a decade from now, if I'm still in office, that your congressman's not going to have to walk to Washington, D.C. We will still have airplanes. I make that commitment to you. And finally, I promise to you that if you re-elect me to the United States Congress, that in 12 years we will still have the planet Earth and we'll still be living on it. Now, y'all may laugh, but you look at this Green New Deal stuff. Farting cows is in it. Getting rid of the emissions from airplanes is in it. Now, I haven't seen very many electrical-powered airplanes, okay? Electricity and getting rid of nuclear power and getting rid of every form of carbon-based electrical generation is in it. There's a reason that it costs as much as $90 trillion a year. Now, you know... I hope you'll forgive me, Chip, for the little bit of levity. But this is serious stuff because these people are serious people and because they have serious power. 
They're in control of the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. On the Green New Deal, you've got candidates running for the United States presidency. A number of them, at least four that I've seen so far, have signed off on this. Bottom line, too, is that it increases pollution. If that's the goal, to stop pollution, this increases pollution. You know how it does it? It increases the cost of doing business in America so much that our industry and manufacturing move overseas to places like China and India where they don't have good quality control measures on the environment, on the water pollution, on the air pollution. And so you actually increase the planet's pollution levels by more of those plants over there that are operating on coal without proper emission controls being put into production and losing production in the United States of America as we price ourselves out of the international marketplace. But that didn't make any difference to these folks who are pushing this Green New Deal. I'm going to nickname it the Green Raw Deal because that's what it is for Americans individually, for their standard of living, and that's what it is for our country. Uh, so with that, I want you to know I very much appreciate your allowing me to serve as your United States Congressman. I hope the Chamber's not mad at me for having a little bit of fun with this Green New Deal stuff with, well, gaseous cows. <laughs> but uh, it's in their resolution. So you have to address it, as comical as it may seem, offhand. And I stand ready for any questions uh, that you may have. I ask uh, Craig to not be uh, gentle on me. Uh, the harder questions are the better ones, although, again, no minutia, big picture things is best, and grandchildren is best of all. Go ahead.